Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here in the issue briefing room, all the way from the Congress Centre. We do appreciate you making the time to travel. Um, we keep this issue briefing format in this part of the world because we like to have as many media in the room as possible. We tend to um, try to keep things edgy as possible and as interactive as possible. So here you'll find um, some of the slightly more sensitive subjects, um, and this session here is uh, no different. I also want to welcome our audience watching us live online on our Facebook channel and also on weforum.org. Now, the other thing to bear in mind about this, uh, this session is it's edgy, but it's also very short. So we have 30 minutes. We encourage um, you know, rapid fire questions and answers. We'll try to avoid, we will certainly avoid opening statements. We're going to start with a round of questions. Um, we will also be having questions from our audience watching us all over the world. So if you see me picking up my phone, I'm not checking my mail. I'm just seeing if we have a, um, you know, views and opinions from the public, which we're going to try to, um, to work into the flow of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to briefly introduce my panel. To my immediate left, Alexander de Croo from Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, Belgium. His Excellency Dr. Miroslav Lachak, Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, the Slovak Republic. And Jan Werner Muller, Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Um, Minister de Croo, I'm going to start right off with the, uh, the question of the session. Are we looking at a post-EU era? No, not at all. Um, I think, yes, there is a Brexit discussion, and the Brexit discussion is about one member state who decided not to be part of the, uh, of the EU. But um, if you look at, first of all, if you look at, at the, the, the opinion polls about the uh, popularity of Europe, actually it went up a bit after the, uh, the Brexit. Um, EU is popular in, uh, in, in, in a number of countries, actually very popular. Um, there's a difference also in, in, in the age group, and this is actually kind of surprising is if you see at some of the election results, which is very surprising, is that actually the generation that created Europe is today the generation that is doubting on Europe. It's this baby boom generation which today has their doubts. If you look at the younger generation, for the younger generation, uh, the EU is very popular. It's even something they don't consider is worth the debate. I mean, this is part of their lives, and it's Maybe that's an issue. It seems that it's even something not worth fighting for because they see it as so, uh, so evident. Maybe second dimension, uh, if you look at what are the topics on top of mind of people today, um, it is obviously migration, but that has, has been do going down over the last uh, quarters. But it's terror, it's uh, creation of jobs, economic policy, uh, foreign policy. Now, if you look at what is happening in the world today, uh, the unrest in the backyard of Europe, um, terror uh, events and so on, I mean, it's quite clear that the most efficient way of tackling that is grouping European countries uh, together. The whole question is how do you make the EU a more efficient mechanism and how do you make the EU a mechanism that talks the language of the people, which today is not enough, uh, not enough the case. But post-EU, uh, post no. I don't, I don't see it happen. Look, we have it, and we, we speak of intergenerational divides, and I'm very glad to see uh, what looks like young people here in the audience, as, as, as well as the usual average age of the forum participant, which is 54 for a man, 51 for a woman. So let's try to work those views in later. Mm -hmm. um, Minister Lachek, this would be a very easy session. We could all leave you know, now if we disagreed you know, flat out that there's no chance of a post-EU era. But let's, let, let's at least explore this. Things haven't been going so well. Popularity may be going up, but the general narrative, and something possibly we wouldn't have been discussing 12 months ago, is that you know, people are thinking about a, a, an end to the EU or a radically different EU that has to, has to change with the times. Well, I don't think it's appropriate to discuss the post-EU era. I don't think it's coming. Uh, what we shall discuss is the better EU era or the post-UK era. Uh, yes, so we are going through difficult times, but 27 members of the European Union want to keep the EU together, want to stay together, want to make, make the EU better. And, and that's uh, exactly what we need to do. So to speculate about post-EU, if, if EU was going to, I mean, to disappear, we will have to create it again. It's, it's economic logic, it's, it's a political logic. Yeah, we, but we, this is a wake-up call. Uh, the Brexit is a, is a consequence of mistakes that were made, a number of policies. People uh, are no longer secure with regards to their jobs, with regards to their lifestyle. lifestyle. Uh, migration has not been tackled uh, appropriately by the European Union. That's uh, how people perceive it. And now we have to prove uh, that we, 
we can actually do, uh, address the issues that our citizens consider important. And the Brexit will be, of course, uh, the first very strong test because uh, it, shows our, it must show our ability to act as one, to, to, be, uh, to stay together, and to know what we want. Uh, UK has made it clear yesterday what, what's uh, their position uh, with which they are entering the, into these negotiations. So now it's for us to, make, make, to, to do the same. And, uh, and it's also an irony that the image of the European Union is much better outside of the EU than inside of the EU, because we are too much focused on criticizing ourselves uh, and focusing on the negative sides. And it has to be people like President Obama or the J Japanese Prime Minister who were coming <coughs> to London to explain actually how good a project the European Union is. So it would also help for, to us uh, if our media would be more balanced, uh, because we are taking for granted all the positive things that EU has delivered and we are focused only and obsessed only with the negative ones. So challenging, but I'm still optimistic. It's, it's almost as if Europe needs to save it, you know, be saved from itself, it's because I remember being a, a, a Brit, the, 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 the number of world leaders who lined up to, uh, to praise and, 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 and encourage Remain voters in the UK were not having an effect. And, and, and I suppose I'm also reminded of the session I, in this very room yesterday on forecasting failures, um, another kind of quite hot topic at the moment, why are we getting things wrong so much? And one of the, uh, the academics in the room suggested that uh, we were, you know, forecasts tend to um, prioritise economic self-interest over emotion. It's very hard to overcome that emotion. So while, while there is an economic logic, then also there, there are emotions. Um, Professor Muller. Just quickly on the Brexit discussion, and I agree on the, the tension between facts and, uh, and emotions. But let's be clear, I mean, a big part of the Brexit argumentation was just blatant lies. I mean, this was not even about fake news. This is just fake arguments. This is about a campaign saying, you know, the EU money is going to be used for the NHS, and the day after saying, well, you know, it's actually not true. Uh, this is about blaming Europe for whatever things that actually have nothing to do with EU policy. And I agree, the pro-EU side not being able to counter that because it countered it too much with facts, whereas I think we should be able to counter it better uh, better with emotions. But I, I agree with what, what, what's been said. This Brexit discussion, trying to extrapolate that to the rest of Europe, I think that is going way too far because the Brexit discussion was, I think, a test case for how actually discussions might be taking place in the years to, uh, in the years to come. But on the facts itself, part of the campaign was just based on lies. It gives me a great pleasure to, 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 to say that the next session in this very room will be about how to manage fake news. It's a huge problem. Well, let's go to Professor. Call it how to manage fake arguments. Let's, let's, it's not let's, fake news. Let's turn to, uh, we're calling it digital wildfires, but that's, that's forum speak. Uh, Professor Muller, you're an academic, but you also, you're a European, but you live outside. What's your, uh, what's your take on the future of the European Union? So I have the privilege of not being a politician, so I'm less concerned about surveys and, and popularity. I don't think, for the record, I don't think the EU will officially dissolve. But I don't find the question about a post-EU era meaningless nonetheless, because there are two ways for the EU to end. One is official dissolution. The other way would be that, yes, we have treaties, but they're no longer really observed. Now, Brexit, in a sense, doesn't call the treaties into question because the treaties are allowed for a country leaving. So everything is regular in that sense. But the treaties also say that all countries observe common European values such as democracy and the rule of law. And for at least a couple of years, we've had at least one country where this is no longer the case, Viktor Orbán's Hungary. And since 2015, we have another country, Poland, where the rule of law has been under attack like never before. What has happened with the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland in December is unprecedented in post-war European history in its brutality as an attack on the rule of law. Now, that doesn't mean that the EU officially dissolves, but this really goes to the core of the EU as a political project, because the EU was not founded to increase efficiency. It was a political project. And this is not just airy-fairy values talk, because also if we can no longer trust each other in the EU, among member states, if we basically say, look, in this country the rule of law is no longer really operational, the whole thing really in a certain way will break down because without that mutual trust, it simply doesn't work. So the EU will probably st keep standing as a facade of sorts, but if nobody does anything about these rogue member states inside, who have also, like Orban, found a way to be basically be both inside and outside at the same time, it's even better than Brexit. You get all the money, but you don't observe the rules anymore. 
If we don't do anything about that, it doesn't seem meaningless to me to start talking about a post-EU era. So it's a matter of actually strengthening, strengthening institutions. Um, let's see quickly how many questions we have. Please put your hand up if you want to ask one. We'll try to take a few at a time. So, gentlemen here, can you remind us where you're from and give us your name? Hi, my name is Alex Pigman. I'm from Echelance France Presse. I have a m question sort of bouncing off of your comment for Minister de Croo. Um, the biggest party in Belgium and Flanders is a party that the NVA, which was sort of considered anti-establishment, maybe populist, has a strongman leader, and now you share a government with. So I thought that maybe if you could help us see how that transition took place in Belgian politics, and for you as a Belgian pol politician from an establishment party, doesn't that sort of give us hope that you know, with the populist rise in Europe, that, that we can somehow bring these parties into the fold like you have in Flanders and in Belgium? It's adapting to populism. Let's just take this question and we'll do two at a time. Um, gentleman here, please. Uh, you take the microphone, sorry. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to know, uh, looking 20, 30 years hence, what is the end game or ultimate vision of the EU? Is it the United States of Europe, in other words, a federal system similar to the US, uh, with the disappearance of nation states, or does it not, is it not intended to go that far? So, uh, so vision for the EU, future vision. Let's just take uh, my good friend Michael Yarmer. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to, to uh, take the question from uh, Mr. Müller to Mr. Lajczak and the call. What is left of EU if you do nothing to Poland and Hungary? I had exactly the same sort. Okay, so let's take the first one first. Um, uh, adapting <coughs> and embracing uh, populism or working with populism. Well, uh, first of all, um, I think my basic rule has always been you have to respect democracy. And so uh, if one party is the biggest one, well, I think the logical option is that they are part of power. Um, now, in Belgium, we have this long habit of making coalitions and of having a coalition agreement, which means, you know, in our case, four parties, what do we have in common? Um, and there we are very clear, um, Belgium is a pro-European uh, pro -European country, uh, we believe in, in, in the European institutions and, and so on. I know that um, the NVA, who we are talking about, have in their own program a more skeptical view on the European, uh, European Union. That's their good right but they are part of a federal government, and within a federal government, we are following a certain, uh, a certain line. I think that um, the last thing you should do is ignore certain parties, and definitely not ignore certain voters. I mean, if voters voted for a certain point of view, well, then um, the least you could do is say, okay, well, this is something we will, uh, we will work with, and we will try to understand, and we might have different answers to the issue being put forward by what you could call a, a populist. Um, but ignoring it is never a good solution. You know, we've had in Belgium for a long time extreme right with the, with, with the Vlaams Belang, um, tried to isolate them for a very, very long time. I do think that having extreme right in a government is, is something I would never, uh, I would never, uh, never accept. But understanding their voters and trying to give an alternative answer to their voters is obviously something you should do. Vision of Europe, Mr. Lajcek, possibly. I think there is no answer to this question that was uh, very actively discussed just before the crisis, uh, what Europe we want to have, uh, a federal Europe or Europe of nations. Right now, we have so many concrete issues and challenges on our plate that uh, we have no time to engage in these academic discussions, and there is no demand for that. Plus, uh, it will th the answer will be produced by the way we deal with the problems right now. Uh, certainly, there is very little demand for more Europe among the member states. Uh, but there is a very strong demand for better Europe. So th th that's what needs a better functioning Europe, and Europe that is closer to people, because we lost that feeling, that connection. Ordinary people don't feel that Brussels cares about them, or the problems we deal with in Brussels are their problems. <coughs> so uh, the way how we uh, how we manage the, the, the Brexit negotiations, the way how we are able to address uh, the, the challenges such as migration or terrorism will help us to find answers to, to, to your question. That's absolutely clear. And also, uh, I think Europe will find itself in a new situation with regard to the new US administration. For years, we have been quietly following the US lead, basically accepting the e e US set agenda and helping to promote that agenda. 
But this might change, and this most likely is going to change. And now my second get, uh, concern is whether EU will be able to defend itself, set our own agenda, and eventually even to, to uh, confront the United States on, on, on the issues where we might no longer agree. And you know that a number of these issues were uh, made clear during the campaign. And uh, the second question about Poland and Hungary, you know, when I discuss the European project with partners from outside of Europe, uh, some of them say that uh, it's an integration project that might have gone too far, that it's too much of integration, too much of uh, regulations given to the institutions. But at the same time, uh, in real life, we see that we are over-regulated in certain areas, but at the same time under-regulated in others. Euro crisis showed clearly that we did not have mechanisms to deal with the economic financial irresponsibility of certain um, state, Euro, Euro member states. And the same goes for the rule of law. We have a very uh, strict uh, and uh, strong mechanisms of monitoring, uh, assessing countries uh, which are part of the process <coughs> of the accession. But somehow we assumed or as if we, we assume that once the country joins the European Union, there is no, no longer need for monitoring because everybody will be so responsible uh, that uh, simply there will be no demand. Now we see that we need that, uh, that becoming a member state does not make you perfect, and we don't have these mechanisms. So Commission is trying to do something, but uh, this, these uh, processes have questionable legitimacy. So I would say, yes, uh, go for less regulation in certain areas, but create mechanisms where we need them, and rule of the law is one of them. And one of the problems that I, and I'll be speaking very openly here, is uh, of course the European Parliament is not very helpful in dealing with these issues because party affiliation uh, plays too strong role here. That means if it's one of us, we will defend. If it's not one of us, then we will attack. And of course with this kind of approach, it's very, very difficult to to address the issues. Uh, Professor Vinner, I, I recognise a, a raised eyebrow and a burrowed frow from, from, from 10 metres away. What, what are your thoughts on the question? Well, I'd be curious to follow up why you think that the so-called rule of law mechanism which the Commission has put into place lacks legitimacy. It might be ineffective at this point because, as we see, they basically have done everything that the procedure allows them to do and, and nothing has changed. I just don't see what's happened. Uh, well, I think at this point... a couple of visits of Franz Timmermans to Poland, to Warsaw, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see a I, I'm not aware of a clear, credible, and generally accepted mechanism. There is a discussion in General Affairs Council about, about establishing these kind of mechanisms, but it's in its early stages. So, and Poland itself is questioning the competence uh, of, of, the, of the Commission to, to act in this. So, well, well of course they are. I'm not <laughs> saying there is no problem, I'm just saying we don't have instruments to deal with this problem. But in theory, I mean, just in theory, if by now Franz Timmermans said, okay, they're not complying, we have to trigger Article 7, at least that would put the pressure on the Council to really come clean, because the Council basically hasn't said anything, with one exception of a statement by Donald Tusk, very late in the game, and at least then, even though it probably would not work in terms of applying Article 7, there'd be a precedent, and one would have a sense that, okay, at least they tried. Because we always, we always think that, oh, if the EU does too much, we're going to increase Euroscepticism in these countries, and they're going to turn away from the EU, and so on. What we always forget is that there are also plenty of citizens in these countries who, in 2004, when these countries joined the EU, thought, okay, there's never going to be a way back to authoritarianism and dictatorship. We're safe. And we're letting all these people down. I agree. I agree. But, you know, uh, in order to activate Article 7, you need unanimity. And there is one leader who said clearly, I will never vote You're for You're right, that. but the Commission, so even that, on its own, could say, at least for the record, yeah. we've tried. Mr. De Croo, was, you know, institutions, how to, how to reform them, or do we leave them as they are? Well, um, I personally believe that one of, the, one of the issues we have is that um, too many topics are being led today by the Council. And, and, and the council has some kind of what you could call a confederate uh, logic. It's heads of states coming together, and too often they are coming together and bringing their domestic problems. And this is becoming some kind of a, a serial crisis-solving mechanism, which is not, not really that bad as a crisis-solving mechanism, but it's not what Europe should be. I think Europe should be much more about uh, what's the vision? Where do we want to go? What's the common European project we uh, uh, we have? Uh, Belgium, as a as a as a small uh, open economy, <coughs> has always been much more a fan of the Commission and giving the Commission more competencies, because the Commission, in essence, 
would fight for the interest of all Europeans, whereas the Council, you have prime ministers fighting for the interests of their home, uh, uh, their home constituency. I think, and there I agree with what's been said, in a number of topics over the last years, um, the Commission has not shown enough, uh, enough leadership. Um, uh, and, and just if I just take in, in my domain, uh, digital single market, which I think is a key element uh, about bringing prosperity in, 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 in Europe. Yes, one thing has been solved, the roaming charges, and that's, that's a great thing and it's a tangible thing that I think makes clear what, what, what Europe is doing for its uh, citizens. There's so much more to be done and nothing's moving because in the Council you have just national interest dominating all the time. But, uh, sorry, may I step in? Yes, national interests, and sometimes, unfortunately, they prevail over the common European interests, and that's part of the problems we, we have to deal with. At the same time, uh, Council represents the member states, so uh, the citizens of European Union, and with all the complications, all the problems, but this is the legitimacy of the European Union. And therefore, instead of speaking <coughs> who is in favor of Council and who is in favor of Commission, it's really about finding the working pattern between the Council and the Commission uh, to the best interests of the European Union and European citizens. I think that we have found this good pattern now, but we are at the beginning of the Brexit process. When Council clearly recognizes that it has no potential, it has no capacity to manage this complex problem, it, it can only be the Commission, but the Council should maintain the political leadership and the political oversight. So we have a, a chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, uh, who represents the Commission, but he will be reporting to the Member States, to the Council, and if this works, this could be a very good precedent for, uh, for our common work in the future as well. But, but I think another way of looking at this is making the Commission more political. I mean, you can give the Commission more political uh, uh, legitimacy, for example, by saying that Commissioners should be members of the European Parliament who have been, uh, have been elected. Could be one solution, there's probably other solutions. But if you give the Commission more uh, political legitimacy, and that is, means something where we will have to take a few steps before doing so, that could be an alternative. I'm not convinced that the current setup is actually something that offers enough perspective on the, on, on the long run. Okay, well, look, thanks very much. We've got two thirds of the way through, so I want to bring in our, uh, uh, the voice of our... And, and look, just, just on time, uh, the lady in front row just put her hand up, please. I was going to say, I wanted to introduce the voice of our younger generation, and, um, and there you go, putting your hand up, being very uh, assertive. Please let, remind us where you're, uh, where you're from and your name, please. Uh, so I'm Cristina Fonseca, and I'm a global shaper from the Lisbon Hub, um, and I think we are talking too much politics here and without fully understanding the problem. Uh, and the reactions we are seeing today uh, uh, from, from the populations are just like frustration because they, they, they lost faith. Um, and we are not, I'm, I'm very positive in, my, in my, uh, my mental framework. I never ever thought about the post-EU. Uh, I've traveled a lot, like, like Europe is, is, is kind of heaven if we compare it to, to, to uh, other regions. Um, and I'm very positive because, because uh, uh, I've met, we've met with, with leaders like political and, and, and economical leaders here and they are really asking us what can we do, we want to understand. So I guess the, 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 my two questions are one, do we fully understand the problem? And two, how can we better communicate with populations and make the, the, our message uh, very clear so everyone understands what's going on and, and people are not afraid. Can we bring in Professor Muller first here? Because it's, uh, the hearts and minds thing is, I, I think is key. And let's, let's have a non-politician tell us how, <laughs> how we can... How we but can still win. not quite an ordinary citizen, I'm, I'm afraid to say. How I'll try my win? best. So, uh, two, two, two points in response. So, quite frankly, forgive me, I don't think that this is a PR problem. I think this was the mindset, especially of the Commission, for the longest time. That the problem is really how do we communicate better. Let's do another glossy flyer. Let's have a constitutional convention, you know, let people participate and so on, and that's going to make people like the EU more. I think that's comprehensively failed. Of course, you want to communicate as well as possible, but I would go back to something you said, which I think is a big issue, it's going to be a big issue in the next couple of years. You remember that in the run-up to the EP elections 2014, there was a sense of trying to politicize the Commission, and the wager was to say, if people have a choice, and then they see their choice reflected in how the Commission is at least led, it's going to increase legitimacy. And I think that the thought is basically right. 
But of course, what has happened since is that many people in the council didn't like this to begin with, probably like it even less now. And in terms of how this comes across, the very fact that the two main contenders, Martin Schulz and, and, and Juncker, basically the day after get together and they now form a coalition against all the anti-Europeans, as they put it, that doesn't really look like serious political competition. So I think that's one thing to watch in terms of where we're going to go. Second point, very briefly, in terms of frustration. I think it's very important that we get the diagnosis of this right, especially at this forum. We've heard over and over again that everywhere, you know, the people are rising up against the elites or the establishment. But not everybody who criticizes the powerful is a dangerous populist. In a certain way, it's good to have new protest parties. It's good if people basically say, yes, I want to criticize existing rulers, but I play by the rules. So I'm thinking of new parties like Syriza and Podemos, who you might not like. You might think their policies are naive and, and, and so on, but it seems to me crazy to say that these are anti-EU forces in the way that Barroso and Van Rompuy initially said, oh, populism everywhere, because that blurs the distinction between these forces and real anti-Europeans like Marine Le Pen and Gerd Wilders, who really are dangerous. So where possible, we should say, look, yes, we might not necessarily like their policies, it makes our life more difficult if we have more fragmented party systems, okay, but ultimately that's democracy. Whereas the real populists, basically those who say we and only we represent the real people in the way that Marine Le Pen, Gerd Wilders, Frauke Petri, and others do it, they are the ones who really could be a danger. And I think that's sort of what we should concentrate, should concentrate on. And if I may slip in one last point. The other thing that, of course, everybody is saying these days is that, oh, there's a populist wave, or as Nigel Farage puts it, a tsunami now rolling across the West, Brexit, Trump, and then, well, okay, Hofa wasn't really next, but, you know, as, Trump, as, as, as Farage put it, somewhat mixing metaphors, the Italian people fired a bazooka against the elites in Italy when they kicked out Renzi. And now it's going to be France, the Netherlands, Germany, and so on. What this, I think, completely gets wrong is that Nigel Farage didn't bring about Brexit all by himself. He needed his Boris Johnson, his Michael Gove, basically his conservative collaborators from the establishment. <coughs> Same is true of Trump. He didn't succeed as a third party independent populist candidate. He needed his Gingrich, his Christie, and so on. So we shouldn't just sort of remain fixated on extremist populist parties. We should always ask, what is the conservative establishment doing in response? Are they making a decision that actually they can work with these people? And if they make that decision, then I get really worried. Very little time, but I wanted to see if there are any more questions that we should try to cover. Gentlemen in the front row. Okay, sir. So please. So I'm Yannick, uh, Global Shaper from the Geneva Hub. And uh, I just have something very simple to say is I feel like as a millennial, what we care about are results and outcomes. It's not that much about who does what. It's not about the institutions. It's about being agnostic when it comes to the institution in charge of doing reforms, creating impacts. And it, and it's about looking at concrete results. My question is, how do you innovate? How do you bring creativity into the EU process? And how do you ensure that at the end of the day, you end up with creating the right condition to empower people to have job and to dream again about their future, but also about what it is to be European? That's a very good point. Larry Summers summed it up very well in the Bloomberg debate yesterday. He said, you know, let's help the key to solving the, the, the middle class crisis is helping people from getting a good education, helping them transition to, to, to work and helping them buy a home, the, 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 real, the real core things in life. Alexander? Uh, I think that is indeed the, the, the main question today. You're living in very turbulent times with an outlook of the future, which we might think things look good, but for most people, it says, well, if progress means that there's more terrorism in Europe, that migration flows are not under control, and that everyone tells me my job is going to disappear, if that's this progress, actually you can keep it and we'd rather go back. And in addition, there's a general feeling that in this world, um, the polit political class, governments, public service, and so on, is not adapted with decision processes for that speed. And I think that's true at every level. I see this at the national level, I see that at the European level. Our way of working is not at all adapted to a world where you have to act faster, be able to take more risk, uh, do certain things where you say, let's try it and we'll see if it works, we'll do it. If it doesn't work, we'll scrap it and do something else. This is the transition we've seen in the corporate world. Um, the way for politics to work needs to innovate in a drastic way being much more experimental, much more agile, but also being more democratic. Having that as a balance, that's a big challenge, but there's intelligent people in the room, so we might think about how to do this. 
very right, quickly. Uh, right now we have to focus on, on the priorities, and, and it's not the distribution of competencies between the institutions, but uh, it's about addressing the real problems of, of real people. And I agree with you that w what matters are the results, but in order to achieve results, we need to define where the problems lie. And here I would like to turn your attention to something that we started during our presidency, namely the Bratislava process and the Bratislava roadmap, where the leaders for the first time in 10 years met outside of uh, Brussels to, to discuss exactly the EU of 27, the post-UK EU. And they agree that the key issues are security, migration, jobs, and also communication. And the process will continue. 3rd of February, they are meeting in Valletta. This is very important. For, for me, this is even more important than the Brexit negotiations themselves. Because UK will, will leave anyway. But what the EU of 27 will look like and how close it will get to our people, that's really important. And I really hope that we have started a good process and we will get there where we want to, to end up. Right, now in the final two minutes, I want to summon the uh, spirit of Kenneth Rogoff. Um, he said a few weeks ago, jokingly, things that everybody at Davos gets things wrong. So with that in mind, I would like you to tell me um, and tell us where you think the EU will be this time next year, starting with yourself, Minister de Croo. Well, I have no, uh, no crystal ball. Uh, things change fast. One year ago when we were here, people were optimistic about the future. One year later, things have, uh, have shifted. So I can, I can only hope to come back to what I said, is that we find a way of acting in a, more, um, in a more decisive way, in a more flexible way, on indeed the topics that matter. And the topics that matter in the world today, uh, security, jobs, um, foreign policy in our backyard, are by essence topics where none of the member states can do it on their own. So it's a clear case that working together is more efficient, offers a better outlook. I will just have to find a way to convince everyone to do this. And of course there are a number of elections next, this year in 2017 which we need to factor into our, our forecasting model, Mr. Lachak. Yes, but don't be obsessed with the elections. Elections are a, n a normal fact of a, of a democratic life. Uh, what's really important is how we deal with Brexit and with the new US administration. And a year from now, I want to see the European Union, which is uh, uh, self-confident, united, and on top of its agenda. Thank you. Professor Muller. So as everybody knows, the EU faces multiple crises. I doubt that any of them will have been conclusively resolved by this term next year. But the question for me would be whether people are willing to basically use the crises, as the cliche goes, as an opportunity in terms of starting to make trade-offs and say we can actually partly give concessions here if you help us with that. That hasn't really happened so far. If that were to happen, maybe things could look more uh, coherent next year. Thank you very much. Well, we are out of time, but we do have to stick to schedule, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us here this morning. Thank you for joining us um, here in the issue briefing room. Thanks for watching us online. The session is now over. <laughs>